Okay, so thank you everybody for joining. My name is Ariel Porvillis. I'm the Director of Product Marketing here at Dundas. And today I'll be talking to you about some of the best practices we use here at Dundas to help you build a winning dashboard. Now, just before we start with the, uh, today's topic, um, a little bit of a, an introduction to Dundas. For those of you who are new to us, uh, we have been around for more than 20 years always in the uh, visualization and BI space. Uh, some of you may know us back from the uh, visual visualization components days. Um, we have come a long way since, and we now have a full end-to-end -end modern BI platform named Dance BI. It allows you to uh, connect, prepare, and visualize data in different formats, such as dashboards, reports, scorecards, and of course, to your own visual self-service analytics as well. Now, while our products have uh, evolved over the years with the different user needs and focusing on different requirements, at the end of the day, we always had one motto, and that was always making sure that 80% of our use cases, our common use cases, are very easy to achieve, and the remaining is still possible. So making sure you're not confined to a box, and you can still achieve whatever requirements you have from your business or uh, from your technical side. So with that, uh, I want to get started on today's topic. And before I dive into those best practices I mentioned earlier, I want to first explain and prove why dashboards are so effective. Here are the results of the 2011 Gartner Executive Survey in terms of how they rank their top priorities. And you can see the analytics was ranked at the fifth position in 2011. Moving to 2012, the analytics jumped to the top position. 2013, still the analytics top position. 14, number one, 2015, you guessed it. The analytics has been a top priority of the uh, executives, not just in the last four out of five years, but actually in the last nine out of ten years. That's quite a uh, quite an impressive message. You can see the actual spend in the uh, in the industry in the industry in the uh, software industry of the analytics definitely uh, showing that that importance that the executive gives that the uh, priority. You can see in 2013 the spend was 14.3 billion dollars, and this year alone Gartner is predicting 16.9 billion spend on software for the analytics. So probably want to ask yourself, are you among those spenders as well? And I think there's, there's a, good, uh, a, a good reason why the industry is paying so much and why they, we see that increase, say, almost a 6% increase between those different years in spending. And there's a lot of business problems that justifies it. So we can see analysis paralysis problems, information overloads problems, operational blowout. People are still managing a lot of data processes with uh, Excel and, and manual data manipulation. Uh, and there's still a big problem with alignment. So there's a lot of spending going on to try and solve those problems. And I would ask myself, are you experiencing the same type of problems? And do your clients or you also spend that, that amount of a, uh, of course, not by yourself, but you also spend a lot of money uh, every year on your BI? And has BI lived up to the promise so far for your organization at least? So here's a great quote by uh, Stephen Few, who's a well-known author and respected thought leader in, in our space, uh, specifically in the visualization space. And what he says is the following, so that the, the methods and technologies that are supposed to support it analysis and reporting, what we know as, as BI, as business intelligence, they often fail to deliver on the promise of intelligence. And, and that is because often the data is not well understood. Um, the fact is that the intelligence does reside with humans not necessarily the, uh, the technologies. And as humans, it's basically three ways we typically consume data in businesses. Um, if you uh, look at most organizations that we know today, it's basically three different categories that they have. It's either reports, ad hoc analysis, or dashboards. There are other forms of consuming data, such as infographics, but I want to focus on the one that are commonly used in businesses and that are repeatedly used to consume information. So if you take data and present using Excel, Access, or some kind of a specialized reporting software, you're creating a report. Reports are very useful because they're very simple. They can spend multiple pages. They can show you data that's very high level or very, very detailed. And they allow you to randomly scan through columns and rows to find what you're looking for. Now, if you look at reports in comparison to dashboards, reports are very multipurpose. Dashboards are usually not. Reports can span across many pages, and dashboards should typically fit on a single screen. Ad hoc analysis, that's, that's a great way to further explore your data and answer new questions that come up that were not previously addressed with your dashboards and reports. Um, these days, tools like Dance BI offer these kinds of analysis using visualizations. So visual data discovery 
can be indeed very useful, but it does require some level of analytical skills to truly leverage the power of this way of consuming data. So not everyone in the business can really use it effectively. Um, and then, of course, there are dashboards, which are what we want to focus on today. So let's move on to dashboards. And what I want to do is I want to start with a misconception. So I want to uh, tackle that one first because that really troubles me when I hear it. Um, here's a misconception. Dashboards are just making data flashy. Some people seem to have this uh, belief that data is boring and that in order to make people pay attention, we need to lure them into flashy graphics, things that move around and, and big dials. Um, a lot of our uh, uh, contacts refer to it as a, what they call sexy dashboards. Uh, there is, there is a definitely uh, importance to a, uh, the aesthetics of a dashboard, but what I want to set straight from the beginning is that dashboards are not just for making data flashy. Um, the goal of, is not to design things that are interesting and attractive. The goal is really to design things that solve real business problems. Now, in our case, these problems are information problems. And, and beauty and aesthetics, these are just the byproduct of a great design, but they're not the goal. Um, dashboards are there to make our life easier. Um, they're supposed to help you become better at what you do. And they're uniquely suited to solve problems that other forms of reporting simply cannot. Now, in the simplest terms, dashboards present the most important information needed to achieve business objectives, and usually at a glance. Now, not everything, only what is critical. Not because data is, is merely informative, but because that data plays a direct part in helping you achieve that business objective. Now, we want to do it not on many screens or spread out over hundreds of pages, but on a single, single screen. And its purpose is to give you actionable information quickly at a glance. I often hear people say that dashboards are really for executives and managers, but they, we feel that dashboards can be for everyone, for the knowledge worker. Um, the power you, you, you can form from this is that the dashboards can even help average Joes to understand large data sets and, and complex relationships. Now here's an example of a dashboard that we have in mind. Now you can see many other live examples on our samples gallery with the URL there at the top. Uh, what's important to remember is that dashboards are uniquely designed and, and purposely built to show the most important relevant data to, to your specific world. Um, in the past, they would be presented within the confines of a computer screen or a printed page. Today, they are present on many devices, including smartphones and tablets, of course. But regardless, you always want to have it available in a single screen, in a single view. Um, now, because most of us are, are, are very busy people and because it's very difficult to get a, a comprehensive view of your whole business, uh, because we have limited time and, and short-term memory uh, uh, difficulties that make it very hard for us to remember what we saw after we flipped to the next page, nothing else does the job that well. Um, and that's pretty compelling. So before we talk about the creation of, of winning dashboards, let's first understand why dashboards can work so well. And it all starts with, with the way our brain works. Uh, our brain is, is a great machine, great with recognizing patterns, but it's not really good when it comes to storing numbers. And I'll give an example to prove that. So here's that example. You can see here three rows of data across 12 months. Um, any company that sells anything in more than two regions is going to routinely create reports that have more data than this. Now take a moment and look at this say, report and see if there's anything that's striking in, in this data. Okay, so now I'm going to visualize this. Oh, if you look at the data and you're used to looking at reports, and I'm, I'm sure there's a few things that they, you've already noticed. You may have noticed that they, right away that the U.S. sales are higher than Europe. Um, some of you may have noticed that they are um, that deep in the uh, European sales in the month of August. Uh, perhaps that the uh, company's European co uh, customers were off on vacation that time, and maybe it's just an error in the data. But overall, the U.S. sales increased, while Europe largely remained flat. Now, the real interesting pattern here is what was very easy to miss with the, the report is that the, the U.S. sales seems to go up and down. Now, if you look at it closer, you can see it's going up and by the end of the quarter, and then it goes down at the beginning of the next quarter. Up again, down, up again, down. This is a very well-known pattern in sales. It's, it's called the uh, hockey stick uh, pattern. It's because of the shape, of course. And, and the reason for it is often because salespeople are, are driven to meet quarterly sales targets so the work often intensifies at that time. So a, a very good example for how I can recognize a pattern with visual, 
but not very easily find a pattern when I'm looking at numbers that I need to store in my brain. And here's how our visual perception actually works. So basically our eyes are sensitive to different stimuli and those are passed on to our brain and that shapes our perception mostly by those stimuli that remain within our iconic memory. So only then it's followed by short-term memory and lastly by long-term memory. So really those, they, those stimuli is what can drive the, the difference in how well we remember and, and shape our perception. And, and here's another example to prove it. And what I'm going to do here, I'm actually going to use a poll. So I'm going to show you a question. And the question will uh, show up on your screen for about 10 seconds. And afterwards, I'll bring up a, um, different options. And you'll just have to choose the right option. So be ready with your mouse. I'm going to give you 10 seconds starting from okay so here's the question 10 seconds starting from now how many fours are there in this data set okay so I'm gonna launch the, uh, the poll and I'm going to let you I'm going to answer it and I'm going to give you a few more seconds to answer it and we're going to close this poll and I'm going to show a few of the results. So what you can see here um, is a pretty distributed um, count. You can see um, almost every uh, option had some responses, 12 not so many, but they definitely uh, a lot of people are thinking that it's uh, either 8, 9, 10, or 11 with uh, a, a slight increase on the uh, uh, 10 and 11 the, uh, values, maybe 9 as well in there with them. Now I'm going to ask the same questions, but I'm going to do a small change um, in the way I'm presenting the question to you. So here's that same question again. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to again show you that same question with, with another small change to the way I'm presenting you that, that question. So again, I'm going to give you 10 seconds and then I'm going to ask that question again. Okay. So now how many of you Think of how many fours are there in terms of different counts of fours. Okay, excellent. So let me show you the uh, results again. So now you can see 94% of people think that the number, the count of fours is, is 10, which is the actual correct answer, versus only 40% that 40 was 10 when I showed the, uh, the answer, the question originally. So that's a great example for the impact of those what we call stimuli that I mentioned earlier. Um, in this case, it is done using what, a, what is known as pre-attentive attributes um, in the form of color, in this case I've colored the, uh, uh, the fours in red, and size, so the fours are bolded and the, uh, um, the other text is not. So you can clearly see now how, easy, how easier it is to actually understand uh, what the data is, is showing you with that uh, set of stimuli. Excellent. So let's say uh, get back to it. And really what I think we, we see here is a clear conclusion. Uh, we must use our eyes. And there's a lot of scientific fact that actually backs it up. So 70% of our body total sense receptors are in our eyes. And almost 50% of our brain is devoted to those visual sense. So there's a lot of scientific reasons to why it makes, makes a lot of sense. And if I put this in an example that is more related to our real world uh, of business, here you can see a set of different trends and, and indicators for a certain organization, uh, in this case it's, uh, for some kind of a manufacturing process. And if I were to ask you to tell me how many uh, uh, bad indicators you should focus on, this can take you a little bit of time on, on this poll. I'm not, I'm not going to pull this again uh, because it's probably going to be too many possible answers. But it, with this view, even if I leave it more than 10, sec 10 seconds, it will take you a lot of time to really realize which indicators you should focus on. And now, if I were to color those uh, trend uh, indicators, uh, the up and down arrows with the uh, green and, and reds, for those who are not color blinded, it's going to be much, much easier now to find which indicators you should focus on. 
I can even make one more one more change and make it even easier, more obvious, uh, by removing the green ones and just focusing on the bad ones. So definitely, you can see the, how the uh, uh, pre-attentive attributes can make a big difference in helping us caring about the right things we should uh, we should be taking care of. Here's another example which is very common. Um, and oftentimes, I see a bar chart that's supposed to tell me uh, some kind of uh, information. For example, in this case, uh, which one of my employees is receiving less than a, a 95 uh, scoring. Um, if I were to show the chart like this, it's going to take you a few minutes to, to figure it out, uh, or a few moments at least. Um, if I were to uh, change this and maybe uh, sort this chart at a target line at 95 and then maybe color all the employees that are below that target line 95, um, you can actually see now it's it's much, much easier to focus on the one that they receive less than 95. So I, I think the conclusion is clear here around how effective visual dashboards can be. Um, hopefully that they uh, get that they off the table. What I want to move on next is is those best practices. And and the reason we want to talk about those best practices is, is really uh, adoption. Um, even though it's very clear how effective dashboards can be, we still have that adoption problem. Um, it's probably the most important key performance indicator there is when it comes to those, those tools. Um, studies indicate that less than 30% of these tools are adopted by the intent end users. And to me, that, that's appalling, especially when you consider the time and resources that are invested in those things. Um, so why is this the case? Uh, there are probably many reasons, but I'd like to present three big ones. Relevance, integration, and design. Now, relevance, that, that's an easy one. Um, if the dashboard doesn't contain things that matter uh, specifically to me, I'm probably not going to adopt it. Um, it's incredibly simple, so it's really astonishing to see people forget about this all the time. How do we make sure that your dashboards are relevant? Um, first thing you want to do is you want to start with people. Um, you want to do it um, not by starting with the data, but actually by building dashboards that satisfy the unique needs of unique people. Um, we call this designing from the top down. So often when I first engage with my clients, they, they'll start off by diving straight into the data. They'll say, oh, I have 200 indicators here, and here's my data models, and here's, here's how it looks like, and let's find some way to cram all of these into a dashboard. And what we propose here is to do the opposite. So instead of that, doing that, let's start with and target the specific end users. Let's learn about how they do their jobs, uh, what their main needs are. Uh, and what role data plays in the decision making. It helps us narrow down the field, it gives us focus, and it's almost always uh, ensuring that we can create content that is relevant to them. Um, then we can pick not only the indicators, but the ones that are really the most critical ones, the one that really matters, the key performance indicators and their actual target. So you want to target specific people, and you want to do that by interviewing people. Um, and you want it not by trying to wear the hat of a consultant or an IT guy or an MBA. Um, you maybe just want to pretend you're kind of an investigative journalist. Um, it's very easy in those projects to, to get lost in technology and requirements documents and often even if it's a big project for having gun charts and, and really forget about people being, being people. We forget that intelligence and data intelligence is not achieved when data is collected and stored and, or thrown up on a dashboard but when the data is understood by humans. Now, the next point is that you, you want to make sure the dashboard is, is, is more relevant by giving people choice. And how do you do that? Um, when we created our application, we really emphasized the importance of, of letting people choose what they see on the home screen or even on the specific dashboard. So um, in, in Dennis BI, some of our clients have hundreds of dashboards and metrics. Uh, we really decided to summarize all those dashboards in tiles and allow our users to build their own custom uh, home screen that contains those different tiles, allows them to very quickly navigate to the right dashboard they want to go to. Um, we also built an option that allows users to modify the dashboard that someone else created and then change that to their own specific design. That could be maybe a, uh, a style change, it could maybe be a, a different uh, metric combination selection that they want to use on the dashboard. Here's an example of such a dashboard where I have that uh, option on the menu to basically copy this dashboard from my own analysis. And that basically allows me to take that dashboard into my own private sandbox and then modify it to my own specific requirements and then share it back with other users. So I'm giving people choice by doing that. And what that means is that employees are really now have a new level of empowerment. Uh, instead of guessing how they're doing uh, and what metrics they, they, uh, they want to care about or go to, they can really customize and control themselves. Um, it gives them a whole new level of self-sufficiency. Um, and for IT and reporting and analytics team, 
it also means that they can free up precious say, resources time by reducing adult requests and, and focus maybe on uh, being able to create new capabilities versus pulling data or generating new reports uh, for, for other colleagues. So you want to use that employee empowerment, you want to give that data self-service capabilities and reduce the ad hoc request to IT, and that way you can make sure dashboards are relevant uh, with always starting on focusing on the right people and then augmenting their power by giving them the ability to choose. Looking at integration, if you want to break down barriers and silos, uh, you can't live in, a, where in, in an environment where BI operates in a silo. Um, it needs to work with your existing security environment um, maybe you can embed it into your existing web application, into your intranet portal, or in the SharePoint environment that you have and, and everybody uses for all the document collection. Um, I think a big one to increase integration is, is really using notifications and alerts that are sent straight to your inbox. So here's an example of, of such an alert that they, uh, I received to my inbox about two days ago. And what I can see here, for example, is a, uh, that Bay 4 has an increase in downtime um, and I can immediately see that thing, that behavior. I can click on that link, maybe go to the dashboard and further investigate what's going on here. So it's a great way to be a bit, a bit more proactive versus constantly having to remember to log into a dashboard and, and consume my information. Um, you can also set this maybe as a reminder to check your numbers whenever new data comes in or every Monday at 8 a.m. before your management meeting. So we can really approve adoption simply by making dashboards a part of people every day's routine. Um, this sort of integration and thinking things all the way through is really key to getting people to use the tools without having to feel like it's an extra step to get to it. But how should things be, uh, be presented? What do I mean when I say design? So here's a great quote from, from Steve Jobs. I really love that quote. It's, design is not just how it looks like and feels like, design is how it works. And what I thought I'll do here is I'll share seven quick dashboard design principles that you'll hopefully take back with you after this webinar. I hope you'll find this useful not just uh, when you design dashboards, but also when you uh, create spreadsheets and, and different reports, or when you uh, want to create a better presentation, or even in your daily communication. I think those principles can apply to more than just dashboards. Number one, you want to show the data and do not distort it. Here's a chart that shows how a teacher's algebra class compares against various benchmarks. So you can see her other classes, the rest of the school, and the entire district. Now you can see the median grade for her other classes, which is represented by the tallest bar, is 79. Now take a look at the other bars and see if you can guess what their values are. Now again, I can't use a poll here because it can be too many options here, but I do expect you to be honest with yourself and really try to guess what number you would assign to the other benchmarks. Now, I'm going to add to the labels, the labels to the uh, value axis. How many of you guessed it correctly? Again, I don't have a poll to prove it, but I'm assuming that a lot of you guessed incorrectly. And why is that? So let's do a real simple adjustment here and change it so the axis starts at zero. Now, this is what the bar chart should have shown from the first place. Now, it's, it's very simple. The reason that we, we had that the uh, wrong assumptions is because our Visual cortex is very good at comparing lengths along, along a common base, and that's why bar charts work so well. So for most cases that I can think of, a bar chart is only useful if the axis starts at zero, unless, of course, your goal is to misrepresent data. So the message here is to let information be the focus, not the visual treatment of the information. Here's a fun one. So this is the result of going into PowerPoint and dropping a 3D pie chart onto the canvas. So here's my 3D pie chart. And to be clear, I, I have exaggerated this one just to prove a point. So can you guess what percentage of our sales came from the fourth quarter? It's, it's quite funny that you actually need to guess that. Um, I can definitely change this uh, visual and maybe make it, make, make it a, bit, a bit easier uh, if we take the perspective out of the chart. Um, it is easier, but it's still difficult and, and to know exactly what the number is, especially if you look at precision. And also, a bit, a bit, it is a bit of a chore to go back between the legend and the pie slices and figure it out which one corresponds to which. So left-hand side is definitely the bad example. The right side is better. But instead, what you can do is you can simply do this. Um, so add this bar chart. And it's interesting how much these changes can improve your ability to consume the data. Um, a lot less flashy, uh, but perhaps a lot more useful. Show the data and do not distort it. 
Now, choosing the right type of visualization for your data is a whole presentation on its own. But another small tip would be, again, on pie charts. So pie charts are known to be bad visualizations from the data visualization best practices point of view. Um, there's a lot of cases where they don't work that well, and there's probably other alternatives that can work better. Um, we love those because we typically like circular shapes, and it, it's, a, um, it's pleasing to the eye. But uh, it can make that task of seeing the data and understanding it quite difficult. Uh, in this example, you can see that the, uh, the pie is forcing me to go back and forth between the slices and the legend. Um, I can improve this by uh, maybe having a different version of this pie chart where the labels are showing off the slices and now I can read the values uh, faster. But uh, again, um, I, I, I would have to uh, uh, um, kind of go across the entire uh, pie and read all the slices to see which one is the biggest value, uh, especially when there's values that are uh, relatively close to each other. Now, I could have so sorted a chart, and that would help with that as well. But again, I would run into the uh, precision problem, and I would force users to actually uh, oftentimes read the values to still understand which slice uh, is bigger compared compared to the others. The best alternative in this case would be a Pareto chart that helps me convey both the percentages as well as the actual number behind it. Um, so the number of occurrences for each category, or basically a slice in the pie chart, would be on the on the axis as well. Show the data, do not distort it. Number two, show context. Now, the easiest way to create a dashboard is to simply take numbers and show them. So here we have a list of agents in a call center environment. So these are call center agents. And, and their first call resolution percentage for the week. So I can see here, uh, for example, different numbers with different agents. And what I can do is I can enhance this visual a little bit by adding some bars. So it will be easier for me to focus on the, uh, the agent with the lowest first call resolution percentage, uh, just by, again, seeing the, the length of the bar. And I can see here, for example, Heidi is one of the agents with the lowest uh, scoring, in this case, 73 uh, for this week. And, and it's an interesting data point, uh, but is she just having a bad week? Or maybe uh, that has been the behavior for the last 12 weeks. Now, to make this truly really useful, we need to show context. And in this case, it'd be helpful if we look at the, the actual trend. And usually when we show trends, we use line charts. But we've got 12 agents on this list, uh, so let's create a line chart that shows 12-week trends for 12 agents. 12 lines, 12 colors. It's a bit of a mess, and it's not a lot of fun to read this chart. So do we actually need a type of precision? Um, do we need the values for all these data points, or is, better, is there a better way to quickly get that general sense of what happened the last 12 weeks? So what we did here is we use what we call spark lines. Um, these are base, basically just mini line charts. Um, they allow us to show different lines for every agent. Uh, so there's no need for legends. As you can see, there's no labels on those. Um, if you want, you can configure it so you can click on a spark line, and then you can uh, pop up a, a bigger line chart with all the values, or you can maybe drill through to another report, um, basically do whatever you want to, to get that uh, specific details. But, in this case, this, the simple spark line gives us a lot more insight and help us to overcome those knee-jerk reactions. Um, so you can see here that Heidi, for example, her value of 73 has actually been uh, um, a pretty good value looking at her previous weeks. So she's actually consistently been improving in the last few weeks. So basically in the last five weeks, her trend is going upwards. So definitely that helps us elevate the discussion uh, that we have around the data. Um, and just one example of how using context can make your data much more useful and actionable. In this case, there's no action required because she's on the right path. So show context. We can also take a look at the, the average handling time for all these agents. Now, I, I don't want to pick on Heidi, but her average today is 26 minutes, which is quite high compared to the others. But how useful is this average really? Uh, what does the distribution across all of her calls look like? Maybe that's just one call where she had the 20, 26 minutes long call, or maybe she's consistently taking 26 minutes to handle calls. Uh, maybe she had a few outliers that they uh, are skewing the average. Averages are used everywhere on dashboards because they're simple summaries, but their utility, particularly in, in cases like this, is really quite limited. So Edward Tafty was known as a, the godfather of modern data visualization and also a rather polarizing figure in our world. He wrote the following. He said, to clarify, you want to add detail. Now, Imagine if we were to list out all the handling times of every single call, agent by agent, for an entire day. That's 
quite a, a large report. It could be a huge report. Well, we've done it here by simply creating a dot or a symbol for every call that's been made today. The placement on the table is determined by the average handling time. Squares represent calls, phone calls, and triangles represent web chats. And we can see that Heidi and a few others had had a few calls with abnormally long handling times. Uh, perhaps we can click on them to get more information, maybe even see things such as the trans transactional level data and what exactly happened in that call and what why did that matter take so long to resolve. Um, so this picture is much more clear than a simple average and really it proves that point of to clarify you want to add detail. This is data visualization's value proposition. It allows you to consume enormous amounts of data in a single glance. Outliers, exceptions, patterns, trends, correlations, distributions, everything, all in a glance. Now take a look at the sheer volume of data we packed in here. There's hundreds upon hundreds of data points on this dashboard. It's, it is interactive, but look at how much insight we're getting even without touching anything. Another example for the UA that we can use to add details in this case is what we call an help overlay. So on this dashboard you can see on the top right hand side is that help button here. And if I click on that help button, I'm adding that overlay on top of my visual that helps me gather a lot of information and explain that dashboard to the user. It can be information such as what does the metric represent, um, how it was calculated, what data is included or excluded, maybe what the uh, target or thresholds I should have for my data. Um, I can even include information around what type of interactions are available in this dashboard, so I can maybe save time on training or uh, helping the user understand how this dashboard works, or, or even at times what actions they need to take when they see the, the uh, values under a certain condition or status. Another important thing to note about this help overlay is that it's, it's designed in a way which is semi-transparent, so I can still see the original values and the context of the explanation when I'm looking at the explanation itself by using that semi-transparent effect that allows me to see the visuals behind it. Number four. Uh, the dashboards I often see today remind me a lot of some of the PowerPoint presentation myself and probably a lot of other people started doing when they, they first started using PowerPoint. Um, a lot of people couldn't resist of turning on every switch, animation, effect, kind of word art shapes or every font color they can find. And it was just PowerPoint for the sake of PowerPoint. Um, we, see much of, we saw much of the same things when people started creating the dashboards, their, their websites. Um, what invariably happens is that people start realizing that their creativity, so-called, is, is uh, starting to gain the wave. So <laughs> I, th I think it's important to understand here that I'm not trying to say that beautiful dashboards are a, are a bad thing. Um, I, I don't want to say that they, uh, you have to be a, uh, using a minimalist uh, approach and, a, and, uh, and, and I do that only because I like a, uh, things that are simple and, and clear. Um, what I think you should, uh, you should think about is, is, is the design that is a result of something that you really have spent a lot of time thinking about. So if you, if you really thought something through enough to be able to distill it down to its very essence, the byproduct of that is the least amount of design possible. Now, what about emotion? What about that visual appeal of that dashboard? That's definitely important. Design can support quick user adoption. Um, if you have a beautiful dashboard, uh, that a lot of people like from the get-go, definitely you have lots of people interested and, and uh, engaged at the beginning at least. Um, but still, that's not necessarily going to make that dashboard adoption lasting uh, over time if the, if the value of that dashboard for them is low. So you want to create a, a visual appealing dashboard, often maybe something which is familiar to your users and to your organization they design, <clears throat> but not at the risk of creating too much design for the sake of design. If you just Google bad dashboard, you can see a lot of examples. Um, again, these are a lot of examples of unnecessary design for the sake of design. If I click on this bottom one here on the right, you can see here on this dashboard is nearly 40% of the pixels on this dashboard that are taken up by clutter, not anything useful um, at all to the user. And I would argue that um, the design of the dashboard is not very appealing to me at least either. And this, this is a good segue to the next point. Uh, you want to make every pixel count. Um, you don't want to waste attention on something that is not important, um, like the title of your dashboard, bright background colors, or big grid lines. The difficult problem is often what you need to get uh, rid of and not what you need to add to your dashboard. Um, so that's where really you can make your dashboard uh, effective. Uh, a great way to achieve that is by applying the uh, data ink ratio. So um, 
that's a, another rule by Tufti, which is saying that the more ink used on your dashboard to present data, uh, by the divided by the total ink that they use on your graphic will help your dashboard to be more data centric. So you want to have a higher number uh, and that's where your design is more, is more effective. So let's take a look at an example that explains that rule. So here's a loaded ink ratio uh, chart. And I'm going to apply a few changes to it to make it a high data ink ratio a chart. So first I'm going to remove the background and then I'll remove the frames. I'll uh, change to single color, remove the effects, remove the grid lines, I'll reduce the font weight, um, I'll use direct labels instead of axes, and now what I can do is I can compare them side by side. You can see on the left hand side you have high data ink ratio, on the right hand side low data ink ratio, and you can see how the left hand side chart is much easier to read and use, and in my, my mind also visually uh, appealing versus the uh, uh, right hand side chart. Here's another example of a, a dashboard designed by Stephen Few, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's a dashboard with implement according to his design dance BI. And often, often his designs are heavily implementing this rule, as, as you can see on this dashboard. Almost every pixel is used for data, and there's lots of it on, on this dashboard. Um, I, I think it's, it's a good uh, um, uh, it's a good uh, proof to the, the point I was making in the beginning about our products, which are always allowing you to achieve the 100% of the use cases. It's actually quite hard in most technologies to get rid of things rather than, than add things. And being able to achieve this type of uh, design requires a lot of flexibility with, uh, with your solution. Again, this sample is also available in our sample gallery. If you want to uh, take a look, just go to our website and open our uh, uh, gallery. You can, you can see that sample uh, live on your computer. Number six, take answers as far as you can. You want to keep asking why and what happens next. Now, not because we want to be annoying, but because we're always pushing people to think about the next step. Now that you have this number, what are you going to do with it? So in this example, we have actuals and targets expressed in, in dollars here. But what are the numbers that you actually need? Maybe what you want is, is maybe the variance. Uh, and, and if that's the case, we should actually show that versus the, uh, uh, the uh, expenses and, and the targets. Uh, maybe what you want is is the actual percentage, not the uh, the dollar value for those that variance. So again, we can show exactly that. So you want to try and take these answers as far as you can, and by pushing those further, the question then becomes: um, Can we go beyond simply making it easier to see things, and actually improve decision making capabilities? Can we make the process more scientific than ad hoc? Um, can we gain some control over the process? This push to continuously take things to the next level is what innovative and great design is all about. And the last point is number seven, content is king. Uh, this goes for anything. The long-term success and adoption of your dashboard is really determined by the strength of its content, not the brightness of its color. Go beyond showing the trivial and solving simple problems to taking a stab at the complicated problems. Now, those are the problems that dashboards should be solving. Uh, these are the conversations that you should be having during your meetings. Um, when you're designing dashboards, those are the debates you want to have. You don't want to have debates around colors and, and effects, uh, much more around the content of the, da of the dashboard. Um, dashboard should really serve to elevate your discussions. And, and you can think of it as going from an old and, and crusty TV to a high definition screen. Um, the enhanced solution doesn't necessarily make people look better or uh, simplify their appearance. Uh, you can just ask uh, newscasters and, and their makeup artists. Um, the additional visual power simply exposes more information, um, whether it's flattering or not. So the conversation you have about your data should take advantage of this extra power and enhance precision. So let's summarize. Um, to gain adoption with our dashboard, we need to look at relevance, integration, and design. Relevance, you want to put the focus on people and give them choices. For integration, you want to make dashboard as part of a system that you already have in place, and you want to maybe integrate with uh, email notifications or any other mechanism that you can use to push that into their workplace environment as it is. And for design, you want to show the data and do not distort it. You want to show context, add detail, design as little as possible, make every pixel count, and take answers as far as you can, and remember that content is king. Now, I hope this uh, has given you a better understanding of dashboards and perhaps some, some new ideas about how they can be uh, used more effectively. One more point I want to make mention here is that you want to make sure you have the right tools to track your adoption rates. Here's an example of a dashboard which comes built in with Dance BI. 
And this allows administrators to track the users and dashboard adoption. So they can actually understand which dashboards are being used, uh, which users are using those dashboards, how long the dashboards are being viewed, how active the users are in the systems in terms of how often they log in. And this will really gives you the tool to understand which dashboards you maybe want to fine-tune their design. Maybe uh, the content of the dashboard is not strong enough. Um, maybe you want to find better ways to push a, the dashboard and the uh, system to the users because they're not often visiting the system. Uh, maybe you want to open more capabilities to the users who are very active in the system. So a great way to understand how successful your implementation are just by being able to track your adoption. So I hope this gave you a good day uh, understanding of some of the best practices we use to uh, increase our uh, dashboard adoption. Um, we are getting close to the end of this, so we open up the floor for some questions. But if you are interested to know more about Dynamics BI and how you can use how you can use it to create your own dashboards, uh, you're welcome to contact our team, and uh, you'll be able to get a live uh, walkthrough or simply just uh, try it yourself if if you wanted to. Um, so what I'll do next now is uh, I'll open up the floor for some questions. If uh, if there are some questions, you're welcome to type them into the uh, Go to Webinar Questions panel, and I'll try to address them within the uh, uh, remaining time. Okay, so a couple questions here. Uh, I should have probably mentioned at the beginning where we get the uh, um, the recording of this uh, uh, presentation. Um, then the answer is yes. Um, the recording will be available and will be sent out to everybody that registered to this uh, webinar uh, in a follow-up email in a couple of days. So there's another question here about how to specifically design and create dashboards in Dundas BI. Um, so there is a great webinar on our uh, webinars page on our website. Um, I don't remember the exact name of it, but uh, if you go to our webinars page, um, it will be quite clear. It was uh, done a few months ago. And it actually shows you moving from data to dashboard, showing you step by step how we create the, uh, the dashboard. So definitely there is there is this type of webinar available too if you if you want to watch it. So there's a question here about the uh, choice of a uh, data visualization that they that we use on our dashboard. Uh, specifically, should I be using gauges and um, and other type of visualization that help help with that the uh, visual appeal that the people perceive? Um, I think the answer to that it, it really depends on on the environment you, you operate in. Uh, we see uh, manufacturing organizations where the uh, uh, manufacturing devices actually use gauges and needles. So it could make a lot of sense to use radial gauges on, on those dashboards. Um, typically, radial gauges are not a great, at least from the point of view of a, the real estate they consume on a dashboard. They take a lot of space. They don't convey a lot of information. Um, so I, I rather use boy graphs or other ways of visualizing information rather than using radial gauges. Um, but again, it could make sense depending on the environment. You need to uh, take different factors into consideration when you, you design a dashboard. And, and as I mentioned earlier, there is a, a whole lot of uh, uh, best practices around the right type of visualization to choose from. In Dance BI, we give that power to the users to be able to switch between the different types of visuals on the fly. So they can decide for themselves. But definitely with the original design, you want to get the right visual from the get-go. Um, one more thing I would mention about that, um, and that's related to another question you had here around training. Uh, as part of our training courses, we, we definitely talk about not just technology and how to implement a, a different data visualization solution in Dance BI, but also about data visualization best practices, and we talk about the right choice of visualization for the right data.
So there's an unrelated question here to, to the topic of today's uh, webinar. There's a few questions about that. So we will get to uh, all the other questions uh, that uh, are not related to today's topic uh, uh, or that we don't have time to get to uh, with uh, follow-up emails. But specifically that question, can we visualize data from, uh, from Hadoop in, in Dance BI? The answer is yes. Uh, we can definitely connect to a different Hadoop environment. Um, there's different ways to do it. We can connect to a, a Hive or Impala. We can connect to a um, different uh, environments you may want to set up on, your, on top of your Hadoop environment, such as uh, uh, at scale or, or Kivos. Um, there's many other uh, technologies that can uh, allow you to uh, basically organize information and be able to connect to it very quickly from a, uh, on top of Hadoop, uh, and we can connect to those as well. So the answer to that is, is yes. Another question here, what level of statistics can we run on dashboards? Um, again, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier in the beginning uh, when I started talking about dashboards, typically you want to make sure that dashboards fit on a single screen. Um, you don't want to have users starting to scroll uh, to find, find their data. And that often determines what type of or what details of statistics you want to expose on a dashboard. Technically speaking, there's a lot of options that they, uh, you can include on a dashboard. If, if I'm thinking of Dance BI, um, there's a lot of statistics that we offer out of the box with our formula engine, and there's a lot of statistics um, that they, you can also add with our AI uh, language analysis uh, transformation that allows you to basically run any statistics or any data modeling uh, calculations you want to run on top of it. Uh, the real question is how you would visualize the results uh, of those statistics. Uh, we do have we do have a lot of visualization um, components or controls in Dance BI that allows you to visualize statistical data, such as box plots and histograms and uh, uh, and trend lines. That definitely helps you uh, run different statistics and visualize that on top of your data. Um, again, it's it's a very generic question, so there's a lot of options for a uh, visualizing statistics. You do want to kind of take the right balance between the target, uh, target users and, and what kind of information they can consume. Oftentimes, statistics are very useful for uh, one set of users, but not necessarily for a, uh, a knowledge worker that they maybe just need more actionable data than just the statistic results. Okay, one more question we'll take here that's, uh, again, not necessarily related to today's topic, but uh, about the training material that we have on, on Dundas uh, BI. Um, there's a lot of free uh, training material available to you on, uh, on our website, um, starting from uh, uh, training videos to a uh, documentation to samples, um, developer samples as well if you're a developer. Um, in the application itself, there's a, also a, a tutorial that helps, a, helps you understand how a power user would be using the system and how he would get started with analyzing, exploring data, and, and visualizing and sharing it with other users. Uh, beyond that, uh, that uh, content which is all available to you, there's definitely some uh, training courses um, that we, uh, we provide regularly, um, either uh, remotely or on-site if, if needed, uh, and those can definitely focus a bit more on, on your organization-specific requirements and help you tailor a solution that works for, uh, towards your success. So with that, uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, joining today's session, and I hope you've uh, enjoyed and learned a few, uh, a few more tips and tricks that they can help you with uh, your dashboard design. I will be uh, uh, available to you. If, if you have any questions, you can uh, feel free to email me uh, directly or info at and we'll be uh, happy to uh, uh, further engage and elevate the discussion around how you can create better, better dashboards. Thank you and goodbye.